Here we go. Roll video. I think anybody creating something new must have an adventure. It's not cinema, it's something else. My advice to a young filmmaker is to make a movie every week. The whole bag of movies can be learned in about a day and a half. But suspense is essentially an emotional process. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta make films, you gotta make it and get a scene. Cinema for me is a world of when I dream. Hey everybody, welcome to Behind the Slate. I'm your host Aaron Strand, and my guest today is a journalist and author who has appeared on both the New York Times and Los Angeles Times bestseller lists. She has authored collaborative biographies with Elizabeth Taylor, Maureen Stapleton, and Ginger Rogers, among many others. Her latest biography, which just came out in October, is titled Small Town Big Dreams and was written with ballerina and philanthropist Nancy Zeckendorf. She also wrote the fantastic biography about Una O'Neill titled Una Living in the Shadows, which was so helpful when I was researching for the Chaplin series. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to introduce author Jane Scoville. Jane, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Aaron. Thank you for that fantastic introduction. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> I, you know, as a as a writer myself, uh, but nowhere on your level, I always want to just start off by asking, how did you begin writing? And then how did you transition into writing biographies? Good question, as I always say. Um, I never thought about being a writer. Uh, I was going to be an actress, of course. I come from Massachusetts originally. I went to New York City, dreamland, and um, I didn't get too far. I, well, actually, I was in a, 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 an off-Broadway play, of Iphigenia in Taurus, I believe, and I was in the chorus, the Greek chorus. But then I decided to get married. And so, I guess you could call me a chorus girl. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I um, I went to graduate school, and then my husband was at uh, medical school, and and then uh, doing internships and residencies, and I wanted to uh, pull my weight, and so uh, I I decided I I would teach. Willy nilly, I began teaching. I moved back to Boston, the Boston area, and I was teaching there, but obviously I, I realized I was going to have a baby. And so I retired for a while. And, and that's when I sort of, I, I started writing. I was on the board of the Opera Company of Boston. And I had a friend who ran this underground paper called Boston After Dark. And so he asked me to write an article about opera. Uh, the Metropolitan Opera was coming to town. So I did. I forgot to apologize for my voice, which I'm recovering from laryngitis, and I'm not uh, I'm not home yet. Anyway, <laughs> um, so I, I wrote this article, and I started writing more. I became a movie reviewer and a restaurant reviewer, as well as a fe- you know, feature writer. I wrote a piece, and I sent it into the New York Times, the Sunday Times. It was about movies, and it got published. In those days, things like that happened. I don't know that they happen anymore. So now I had a great credit. From there, I blossomed into uh, books. Uh, I was very friendly with an opera singer named Marilyn Horn. Another friend of mine who was a writer who lived in New York called me and asked me if I would write a recommendation for him to write her book. And when he said it, I wanted to fall out of the chair because I was thinking, so why didn't I think of that? And then... I never heard anything about it. And then his wife called me. We were talking. We were friends. And I said, how's the book with Marilyn Horn going on? And she said, oh, he's not doing it. And she said, why? Why are you asking? She said, don't tell me you want to do it. I said, yeah. She said, well, why didn't you say so? I said, well, because he was doing it. Why would I say so? Long story short, he then sent me all the stuff he had done prepared, which was really nice. And I did that book. So that's how I got started on it. And I did that for a while. I enjoyed it because I got to meet a lot of great people, and uh, it's fun to take other people's voices. I then decided I should do something, a biography. And Una Chaplin went and died, and there was a headline on a newspaper, and a friend of mine saw it, and he said, boy, 
that'd make a great story. And I thought back and I thought, sure it would, because when I was young, I remember uh, being infatuated with Una Chaplin because she was Eugene O'Neill's daughter. And then she married Charlie Chaplin, and he was like five million years older than she was. And they stayed married, and, and, and I, it, I, did, I didn't know anything about it. I called my agent, and I wrote a proposal, and it got accepted, and so... Bingo. How did you go about your research uh, for that book? Where, where where did you start and where did it take you? Now, that really is a good question. It took me about eight years to do that, the Una book. But I was doing other books at the same time. I went to California. I hooked up with a friend who was in the writing trade as, as well. And she said, well, come on over to the library at the uh, UCLA, I think. And she typed in Una Chaplin and nothing came <laughs> And she looked at me and she said, Jane, how can you do a book when there's no secondary sources? I didn't even know what secondary sources were. Well, I found out. I was in the library all the time. I bought books every minute when I could. I don't even know how I did it now. Doing what I did in those days was really an act of courage and stupidity, probably. <laughs> And the difficult thing was the family was positively not helpful. I mean, they, they, they didn't want to hear from me. And I found out why there was a writer who had contacted them. And this, again, was after Charlie had died. And Uno felt misled. She was obviously trying to write a, uh, a gossip novel about it. I guess the children were kind of open with her at some point. It was never written or published. So naturally, when I tried to contact these people, they were very polite, but stay away. <laughs> you couldn't blame them. But I got lucky because I met this wonderful lady. She was a Charlie's cousin and very close to the family and a perfectly wonderful woman. And she helped me. But that was the, the hardest thing about doing the book on Una was to get to the people who knew her. And one day I was in, a, I was in the beauty park. <laughs> Someone said, how is the book on Una Chaplin going? And this woman next to me getting a manicure said, Una Chaplin, I went to school with her. There's so much luck involved. You have no idea. So, you know, it, it took so much time to get to all these people. And in the meantime, I was, you know, doing books with other people. And then the nicest thing was after it was published, Betty Tetrick, the cousin, told me that... Um, the children were pleased. It seems that Una has this magical quality that's both magnetic but also mysterious. And in your book, you know, it's the most comprehensive book on her. And yet there's something about her that always seems to keep even the people closest to her at arm's length. Talk to me a little bit about that quality of hers and how you dealt with that in, in writing her book. Again, an excellent question. It, it puts me back in, in remembering what I had to go through because of that. There were a lot of people who thought she was just another pretty face. And don't forget that. This was a really beautiful woman, lovely woman. She cast her spell on a lot of people. Her childhood was such a, a wreck. She was wary. I mean, she her father walked out on the family when she was three or something like that. You know, of course, the, the O'Neill family, the great his father, the great actor, uh, James O'Neill, he would have been one of the great classical actors of the American stage. But he got this pot boiler about the Count of Monte Cristo, a uh, dramatization, and he made money hand over fist. So he became a matinee idol rather than a great uh, classicist. And uh, I think probably he felt he was a failure, uh, basically. And then, of course, he married a very refined, lovely woman who, in giving birth to uh, Eugene O'Neill, was attended by somebody in the, the hotel room they never even lived in a home. They lived in hotel rooms. There were complications, and she was in pain, and she became a drug addict. Eugene O'Neill always had that over his head, that he turned mommy into a junkie. So he was distant, and her mother was a character, Agnes Bolton. Aggie was there, but she was a piece of work. Uh, you know, She was a writer, too, and not without skill. 
and a very beautiful woman. Then the mother, she had a boyfriend who was actually very nice to Una. Then they broke up and that broke Una's heart. You know, you hate to do this because then it makes you sound like those people who are always trying to find the psychiatric reason or the psychological reason. But honestly, if ever any woman was looking for daddy, it was Una O'Neill. And it was so obvious. And Charlie fit the bill for her. But Charlie had his problems, too. In fact, his problems were so great that Justin Kaplan, I remember, he never did do the book on Charlie Chaplin. And I I found out years later, because I asked him how the book was going. And he said, I didn't want to write about him. I didn't like him. Particularly was not happy with this uh, young women kind of thing, uh, going after young girls. I shouldn't even say women. How did you, in writing the book, both navigate um, the sort of, you know, psychological analysis of Una's behavior and then also navigate that those difficult aspects of Chaplin and and you know a lot of biographers seem to want to redeem Chaplin through Una or you know because their marriage lasted so long then it's all okay you know he was just looking for Una all along or sort of these sort of retroactive forgiveness sort of things and and yeah, you really yeah. avoided that so how did you navigate these two difficult aspects of these people's story personally you know you find uh, it's repellent horrible and it's a sickness it's a mental sickness. This was when Freud, by the way, Freud was still king. Everything was Freudian. Today, yeah, what we see in all the things that have come since then, uh, Me Too and all of this, this kind of behavior that you really got away with in those days, you don't get away with anymore. You know, I'm trying to think how I did it. And I think one of the ways I did it was I just accepted it and moved on from it. You don't make judgments. I'm not judging them. I'm writing about what they did or were purported to have done. She was totally infatuated with him. But the sad thing is that she was going with a man. She really wanted to marry him, but he didn't want to marry her because of her drinking. You know, she was a drunken alcoholic. This was after Charlie was gone. She had too much to drink one night, and she just burst out. What the fuck did I do with my life? It's quite sad. What do you think was in that? Do you think there was real regret and that the perfect love that they described about one another was a lie? Or do you think that was the O'Neill curse coming no, no, back? I don't. I think at first he gave her everything. He he was there and he, you know, she, she was his baby. And, you know, she'd been brought up by this austere man who, who was a tortured human being who never should have had children. You have to get a license for fishing, for hunting, and for getting married. You should have to get a license for having children. I mean, that guy would never pass a, a father test. And I think that she might have been quite content for some time. But then he, I think probably he he got a little dotty in his 70s. And, and this was the man she looked up to, and he was like an infant. Her statement when she was asked, and she said, he took care of me when I needed to, and I'm here for him, and I always will be. And I believe that to be true, but I also believe she she was uh, drinking uh, a great deal. And it's funny, when I started the book, I had no idea that she was an alcoholic. That's part of what I learned in doing the research. You know, you might have taken a good guess since her brother was an alcoholic. Her father was an alcoholic. Her half-brother was an alcoholic who who committed suicide. That's heavy. So any moment that this woman had for some kind of happiness must have presented itself as the greatest boon. By the time he died, she was a full-fledged alcoholic. So, you know, there's always the solace in the bottle. She came back And she lived, she was out in L.A. for a while, and then here in New York. It was a half-life. It was going out, dating, having a good time, good. And then all those years, the sorrow of all those years. And and then, of course, she got the cancer that ate away at her. I mean, it's horrible. I, I, I remember feeling so, so sorry for her. 
so sorry for her. If there had been one little different turn, maybe things would have been, she could have found something. I, I don't know. I think her life was chartered. The stars, mother this way, father this way. Now I'm going to ask you to to not be your objective writer self, but just you personally. Do you think it's fair to blame you know anyone for that tragic turn? Obviously, we, you talked about her parents just a minute ago. Is it fair to blame Chaplin? Is it ultimately only fair to blame Una herself, or is blame is not really a something that should be thrown around here? We have choices. We're all given choices. We make one choice and don't make the other. It may have been that we just made the big mistake, that that was really the choice we made. I don't think anybody on purpose tries to to make their lives less happy or tries to make their life miserable. I think she was in search of of love, of affection. It's, It's very easy to pass judgment on other people's lives. You you really have to be inside and and to to be presented and have the equipment that she had to deal with what life gave her. It's fun, Aaron, for for me to look back and think, but I haven't really thought about it, but she she comes back so quickly uh, because I always felt so bad for her. And as a biographer, I'll tell you one thing. There are moments in someone's life that you write about and you think, oh, gosh, if I could only go back and say, don't do that. What is that moment for you uh, with Una's story? (laughs) I don't know. Uh, For her to marry Charlie at that time is probably the right thing to do. It got her, you know, what she wanted. And she served him. She really did. And I I made that example, I think, in the book, the Cosima Wagner and Richard Wagner. Listen, that's what a woman did. You went to school and then you got married. She never went to college. And I think she got into Vasa. Yes. But didn't choose to go. It would be Vasa. I'm laughing because one of my granddaughters went to Vasa. <laughs> that would have been the perfect. You know, if she had gone to Vasa, she might have come out of this because they would have encouraged her to use her, her own mind and her intellect and, and things like that. That would have been quite the moment to, instead of going out to LA and wanting to be an actress or go see her father or whatever. Um, I wanted to ask you sort of, you know, your work focuses so much on these incredible women. And in the case of Una, and I believe some of the other subjects of your books, they're often framed in the the broader narrative by the men in their lives. Why have you focused on these stories? And how has that sort of sexism and misogyny affected our cultural history? And, and are, how are you working to try to overcome that? I think you're putting more onto me than I, I actually have. I, I'm trying to think of the women. Uh, well, you know, Ginger immediately, Rogers popped into my mind. And Ginger was, nobody was going to take advantage of her. She barged right in there. Edward Everett Horton made more money in, in the film that they made together than Ginger did. He was the uh, secondary male role. In my lifetime, I've seen it. Balance is, is, is perhaps coming, a, 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 certainly a little, a lot better. And if you see things like Iranian women going out to most certainly be killed if they're lucky and just raped if they're not, you realize that strength, somehow or other, the women who have made a name for themselves usually have uh, something in them that is, has put them in that position. And here's one last story for you. It's not about Una. Ginger Rogers, Ginger was in a wheelchair when I worked with her. She was a Christian scientist, so. And she lived up in, uh, in Oregon, Medford, Oregon. I was there, and it was a Saturday. And I drove over, rang the doorbell, rang the doorbell. Rang, nobody came. She had people that lived with her, an assistant. And I was about to go away when the door opened, and there was uh, Ginger in the wheelchair. I said, Ginger, you're not expecting me, are you? And she said, well, I, I just washed my hair. She said, come in, come in, come in. So I went in. She said, I, I, I can do it. I can. She, says, just, she says, will you dry my hair first? I took the <laughs> hair dryer and the, and the comb, and the brush. I'm not a hairdresser. And I'm doing this. And then all of a sudden, I thought, 
I'm brushing out Ginger Rogers' hair. My idol from the screen. <laughs> I was a kid. You know, it's moments like that that you think, oh, it's worth it. Real quick, uh, before we uh, go here, I saw on your website a photo that in 2013 at the Film Forum, you attended, I think, a screening of the kid with a, a children Charlie Chaplin lookalikes who happened to be judged by Melvin Van Peebles. And spoiler alert, I, I couldn't believe this. This is such a synchronicity because Melvin Van Peebles is the next director that we are going to feature on our show that we're going to tell the story of. Wonderful. He's such a wonderful... Oh, boy, I'll be looking or, or, or hearing for that. <laughs> what, uh, can, can you tell... What was that What was that event like? And, and how did you uh, end up there? The director of the repertory films at Film Forum is a, is a guy named Bruce Goldstein. And Bruce and I are old and good friends. And Bruce knows more about movies than anybody. I know a lot about them. I grew up in the movies. I love the movies. Here's a, a little known fact. My great uncle was Louis B. Mayer's partner in New England of the, of the theaters. And then Mayer went out to Hollywood and he wanted my uncle to go out with him. And my uncle wouldn't go. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I really grew up, movies were everything to me. So I was on the board of the uh, film forum for a number of years. And so Bruce said, you might want to come down. And I met, I think her name was Kira Chaplin, a granddaughter. She's in the picture too. Right, right. And I invited her to come up for lunch and we had lunch. And she was very sweet, very lovely girl. And uh, I finally got to, to be with some of the Chaplin family. <laughs> but they were gosh it's so cute film forum is one of the treasures of this city and seeing these kids get up there with i remember my father imitating charlie jeff you know do the <laughs> walk and things like that well this has been just a delight yes thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us it's a, uh it's a real pleasure dear Thank you so much uh, uh, for writing the book, for having this incredible resource about this amazing woman that everybody should know more about. And I tried to get uh, people, to, uh, you know, interested in a play or a movie or something, but Chaplin came out around that time, and um, that wasn't such a success. I went to the premiere in London, and the Queen attended. You know, everybody had to be seated, and then the Queen, you saw her on a screen coming in and coming up the stairs. And there was this big mirror. And I'll never forget, she had that handbag. And she looked in the mirror and then she saw a spot on her handbag and she brushed it off with her other hand. And I'm thinking, she, she's the queen. <laughs> she's making sure you know, there's, there's no food spots on her, on her whatever. And then she came in. <laughs> she was great. So you see, being a writer is the best thing in the world because... It takes you everywhere, and you get to see people in your life you would never see. That's amazing. Um, where can people find you? Where can people find out about any upcoming work that you might have? Well, on my website, I am working on a. I'm working on a book now that I I love so much. This gentleman, his name is Brian Large, and he's is an icon in the music videos uh, world of, of more classical nature. He was the one who did the first three tenors and. Those are the popular ones, but I never heard of him. And he took me out to lunch and he said, I, I would like you to do my book. And I remember him saying, I, I think you'll be in for a few surprises. His life. I mean, he's an amazing gentleman, Brian Large. I think my website would probably have him. So everyone should check out janescoville.com. Uh, keep uh, eyes peeled for that upcoming book. Go buy Una Living in the Shadows. It's fantastic. Go buy all her books. She's an amazing writer. Go produce my play on Maureen Stapleton. <laughs> Someone go produce her play on Maureen Stapleton. I know you were an actor. I would say you can play Maureen if you like. <laughs> <laughs> that would be that would be quite a stretch for me. Um uh, I am six yeah, foot four. I think but. it would, dear. It's it's quite a stretch for another woman to play a little. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jane, so much for joining us. And until next time, that's a wrap. My troubles have melted away. Once it was stormy for me, things looked black. Oh, I felt abandoned, and then. The